This is The Yay. I'm Reg Clay. And Norman G. This is The Yay, where we talk about life in the theater and the theater of life. Yay! All right. The Yay is sponsored by Central Works. We want to thank Central Works so much for sponsoring The Yay. Central Works, the new play theater, reinventing theater one play at a time. And uh, this is a treat for me. Usually I can indulge myself since I started, I helped create the show. But uh, two of my dearest friends, this is a family reunion, Bob Zick and Travis Bedard. Uh, gentlemen, how are you this today? Uh, doing well, great. it's good to see you. Yeah, yeah, it's real good to see you, Reg. Yeah, uh, so um, the two of you, the two of you, I mean, the origin story of you guys are, are just, it's just amazing. You guys drove, I think, in a car from New Hampshire, I think both of you graduated from the same university, drove all the way to the Bay Area to just, you know, start theater. And uh, I think you guys were living out of a car at one point. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those stories that, uh, you know, once you get out of college and you want to start theater, this is the sort of story that you're used to hearing. And uh, you guys lived it. And now you guys are still in your own little worlds, is still involved in theater. So I think it's really, really cool. Yep, it was a uh, it was a purple uh, Chevy S10 pickup truck that we moved out in. Uh, it was uh, September of '99. Um, I don't think Travis was really prepared for the move when we came out there. It was kind of uh, I'm moving to California. You want to come? And we packed up the truck, drove pretty much straight across country, and wound up homeless in Berkeley for the first weekend that we were there. Yeah, no, I was not prepared for that move. And actually, as a 45-year-old adult, I do not approve of me moving across country <laughs> without a plan or money or having ever been to the place I was moving. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. But hey, th this is what, you know, dreamers dream. And, you know, uh, you guys have lived the dream. And in the Bay Area, you had the dream for a little bit. And then uh, you moved on to do other things. And we'll talk a lot about that. But as I begin each podcast, Norman, how was your week? Ah. <sighs> So I, I found out that this is a, a part of my life now, and it has been for a few years. School is sort of starting, or oh, trying oh, yeah. to start. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's a hard time of year for Mara. It's, you know, given that we're in this quarantine, everything is in flux and weird. But the thing that is still true is suddenly she has to get up to deal with school stuff in the morning, and I don't. <laughs> Now, is this school meaning Dexter or is she, her? because I, I think she's a teacher, right? She, um, she works at a school. She does uh, their music program and does some uh, class aid stuff, which is all in flux right now, because how do you do that? How do you aid on Zoom? Um, so they're all trying to figure that out. And then Dexter actually starts uh, at San Jose State Monday. He's on his way down there right now. They're giving out free backpacks if you go to campus. So he's on his way down. To, to pick that up. Yeah, no, for me, it's been a relatively quiet week. I've got a new project that I'm working on with shots that'll come up next week. So I'll talk more about that later. Cool. And other than that, we cleaned up the yard for last week and that went really well. And um, I'm just sort of trying to figure out, oh, biggest thing. <laughs> My birthday season has started. Oh, there you go. All my friends laugh at me. People will say, oh, yeah, I do a month. No, 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 not a month, not a week, not a weekend. A season. <laughs> Whatever number you're turning this year, that many days before your birthday is your birthday season. And so my birthday season just began. Because <laughs> well, I know you do like a usual biking thing. I don't know if you can do that. Oh, or, or gosh. Maybe well, we can bike. I got to get in touch with him because he's now in Canada. Um, I have a buddy. So it was weird. Mara, Mara and I met in 2013, or we started dating in 2013. And that was the year that the Bay Bridge opened, the new Bay Bridge on the east side opened. And it included a bike path, which initially only went not even halfway, and then most of the way, and then finally to the island. And, uh, and a buddy from high school, I just posted as part of my birthday season that I was going to do a bike ride on this new bridge. And he said, well, I would like to come if that's okay. His birthday is a couple of weeks before mine, and we've been celebrating it this next year, I think will be our seventh, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, so we'll definitely have to set a date. He said, even though he's in Canada, he will come back for the bike ride. I'm like, cool. Right on. Bob, oh, and then we go to Ikea afterwards. Yeah. Bob, I had a question for you, because you're a teacher. I mean, how are you 
as a teacher handling COVID-19, I mean, some schools have already started. And of course, we know, uh, you know, there's some states who are opening schools. There's some states who are like, no, 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 it's going to be a remote in place. What's happening with your school district? So I'm in Orange County. Uh, oh! At Fountain, Fountain Valley High School. And uh, we just had our uh, opening plan approved by the board last week. Now, uh, there's some uh, issues that are going back and forth between the district and our uh, the teachers union, uh, but the plan has been approved by the board. And what that plan looks like is we have a, an option for students to do completely online uh, for at least a semester. And there's a hybrid version for the district. And the hybrid version is where you are online one day and then you're in school uh, for uh, two of the remaining four days. Like each class is divided into two and uh, returns to class uh, for two days of the week. Uh, so it's kind of like a block schedule. Um, that, that's our hybrid model. It's going to be tough because I know that you teach theater and I, well, Norman, you're also teaching uh, theater, I think as well. Doing it because I think when I think about teaching theater, when I think about some of the professors and some of the teachers I've had in high school who taught theater, it's such a tactile thing. I mean, I've had a professor, you know, put their hand on my stomach to say, you know, make sure you're breathing right and all that sort of stuff. How difficult or easy is it to do it virtually? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. It's a, it's a tough thing to do, um, at least for that part of uh, the, uh, the practice of doing theater. Um, I think there are things that we can do. Um, we can certainly uh, teach the basics. We can teach the vocabulary. We can teach, uh, we can talk about and through video uh, do things like the breathing exercises and uh, physical and vocal warm-ups, um, maybe even play some games. Uh, we can do monologues. Uh, we can even do uh, performances uh, virtually, but it, it's not ideal. You want to be with your students working together, um, touching, uh, uh, playing games, getting close to each other, getting comfortable with one another. This puts a whole new barrier in into what we're trying to, to do, um, which is to relate with one another. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we've got those challenges, but we'll, uh, we'll do our best to work through all of, uh, all of those challenges. Um, last year, when this all began, we, moved, we were in the middle of putting together our spring musical, which wound up being canceled. Uh, but we found some new avenues to to pursue. Like we did a uh, a nailed it uh, series where we gave kids projects to do at home, and they videotaped themselves doing uh, this project, and then we broadcast it on our uh, on our website. Uh, we did showcases, we did uh, awards shows, kind of like we normally would for our school year. Um, so it's different challenges, but I think being a theater person, we're uh, we're built to uh, adjust, to adapt, to improvise, and that's what we've done and we'll continue to do until we get back together. Yeah. Uh, Travis, I was going to ask you, how are you handling uh, COVID-19 up in uh, Wisconsin? Uh, do you teach at all? Uh, I don't, but we're in Wisconsin uh, for my wife to begin. Uh, she's a, an assistant professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison teaching uh, theatrical design and uh, Wisconsin is doing what they can to empower teachers uh, to make the decision of this component of class needs to be in person. So they're encouraging you to do anything that needs to be virtual to do it virtually. But if you honestly believe as part of your pedagogy that it needs to be in person, it can be but here are the guidelines you need to follow to make that happen. Here are the class sizes they need to be. Here's how you need to break your section up to bring them safely into the space, given this space. Um, so on a, on a project by project basis, it's deciding whether or not it needs to be in the room. You can do a, a lot of design stuff virtually. You can do a lot of design stuff in VR, uh, but you can't do everything 
virtually because the way light falls on a body is different than the way you program light to fall on a body. It looks different. There's a, a different aesthetic to it. And you need to know what that is if you're learning how to design light on a body. Uh, but the school is really doing what it can to empower each individual teacher to make that call for themselves and then give really clear guidelines to make make safety uh, possible given that decision. Yeah, no, I hear you. And it's fantastic. Uh, Megan Riley, that's your wife. And uh, she was part of the, you know, I would consider the crew of you guys coming from, I think she also came from New Hampshire. Is that right? She did. Yeah, there were, yeah. There were a raft of us. There were five, six of us mm -hmm. uh, around yeah, at that time who all came from the University of New Hampshire. Yeah, and that was a motley crew, and it, it was just fantastic, and it's fantastic. She's an associate professor, and, uh, you know, all of us have sort of grown and are doing some wonderful things. Norman and I, we always talk about, you know, uh, for those who leave the Bay Area, what are we doing after, you know, theater, or what are we doing after Bay Area theater? How are we growing, and what do we take from Bay Area theater and apply it to our lives? And you guys are doing it. And that's why I have you guys on the show. It's, I think it's fantastic. Let's talk about some current events. Uh, Kamala, I mean, are, are any thoughts? You know, she is the vice president candidate. And uh, I think she sort of injected some new energy into the race. Uh, Oakland girl. Thoughts? Yeah. Very yeah. happy. It is, it is really, really odd uh, being outside the Bay, being outside California, and having Gavin Newsom and Kamala Harris just be these national level figures. You know, as someone who left the Bay in 2004 when they were still local folks doing local things, and just to have everybody know who they are and what they're doing uh, is, is a little disorienting. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think it's fascinating that someone as as liberal as she is, is being painted by the left as a conservative right. and by the right as a radical. <laughs> and, and just neither of those things are what she is. Well, this will prove how smart she is because I think she is smart and she can use that. You know, what, are the, what, is, the what is the right going to say? We're for law and order and she's, oh, a whole career of law and order. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, already the right are having a real hard time. Maybe even Trump is having a hard time. I was so pissed off. Usually, you know, back in the day, polit political things would happen or the president would say something and it's like, well, it doesn't really affect my life. Okay, that's just happening in Washington. But with Trump, it's, it's as if he's deliberately injecting, you know, anger and, 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 you know, just all of these raw emotions into you by every word, everything that he says every day. And, you know, like a couple of days ago, He's bringing up the birth of things like, well, you know, she was born in the USA, but her parents aren't. So she's an anchor baby. And I was so upset at the reporter. I think she was from Newsweek talking about, well, Trump, what do you have to say about some people saying that she's not qualified to be the vice president? I'm like, why are we doing this? Why are we still bringing right. these dog whistles? And that's what the, that's what they are. Newsweek apologized for that today. Huh? After they spent Newsweek apologized for that today. Yeah. Yeah. After they spent a half week letting right. it rack up views. Right. Right, exactly. I, that's how he operates. It's all about dividing us. It's all about causing uh, uh, people to choose a side and stay on whatever side they're on, keeping those sides divided. And it, it is, it's really tearing us apart. It's, it's uh, affecting everything that we do. Uh, our uh, my family, uh, Christie's uh, family, uh, we have different views, and these become conversations that we have when we get together. And there's no bringing us together on on these topics. It's it's fortunate that we're we're people that we can uh, still love each other without uh, having to believe the same things. But that's what it is. We've got two different views and belief systems that are being built in this country. Does it well, and, and further, the, yeah. the way that we're operating in terms of our news intake, we have two completely different set of what we believe are facts. Absolutely. It's, yeah. not that, it's not that my friends uh, who are supporting President Trump have different values than they ever have or that we disagree values-wise because then I don't think we'd be friends. They honestly 100% believe 
that an entirely different set of things are happening in the country. Yeah, I mean, it's been a litmus test and Trump has de deliberately done it. Well, then again, the platform that Trump is stepping on has been around for a while, whether it be the Swift Votes veterans in 2004 when Kerry tried to, you know, uh, run for office, uh, to the, the uh, what do they call them, the, um, the Patriots or the, there's always been some alt-righters yeah who have tried to step in. And that's you know, basically what, that's the dog whistle that Trump is using. You know, he's basically just polarizing everything. But I agree with you, Travis. I mean, it's interesting. You know, we, we were around when, you know, Gavin Newsom was just running for governor against, um, I'm sorry, uh, for mayor of San Francisco. And, and Gavin Newsom was the conservative choice for mayor. <laughs> right. <laughs> And the guy who ran against is still uh, a, 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 dep a deputy public defender. And, uh, and of course, Kamala, well, I mean, I remember giving pencils to her <laughs> when she worked as an ADA. Uh, and of course, we just see these folks ascending. Uh, so it is interesting. It's, it's, it's really, really fascinating. How do we feel about the U.S. Postal Service and the very fact that, I mean, they, yesterday they said that they're not prepared to handle at least four ballots in 46 states. And Trump is deliberately using that, not funding the Postal Service uh, to sort of thwart the election. I mean, he's not even making it a secret. He's basically just saying it. Right. You know, I get the feeling that Trump is, he steps on the third rail to say, well, let me see if it's going to shock me or hurt me or whatever. And he just does it. H how do you guys feel about that? Well, I, I think it's awful. I think what's happening is awful. I'm hoping that there are steps around it that I think that uh, state governments will be making changes to their laws because a lot of the states have uh, laws on the books that uh, mail-in votes cannot be counted until uh, the day of the election. So that's one part of it, that if, uh, if ballots are coming in on the day of election, uh, they'll, uh, they, may not be, uh, they may not get counted. Um, the other thing is if they start changing their laws to say we can accept ballots and start counting them ahead of time, then that could alleviate some of the problems. I think uh, with that, then it, re it requires the media, the, uh, the conversations like these to go out there and say, get your votes in early to uh, as soon as you get your ballot, as soon as you can get your ballot, get it turned in and add that 50% 50 cent postage stamp to the ballot so it gets in on time and is counted on time. Yeah. Travis, what, what's the environment there? I mean, uh, you're, I, I've never been into a swing state before. I mean, uh, do you, are you, do you, you know, uh, you're, do you express your political values or do you keep it hidden under the vest? Uh, how's it operating in, in Wisconsin? Well, I am newly to Wisconsin and haven't been much out of the house uh but the same the same sort of effect uh was true in minneapolis uh you know dead center in the twin cities uh, you could pretty safely uh, count on it being liberal or liberal friendly views but once you got out to even the second ring suburbs uh it was pretty aggressively conservative and so you would, you would pipe down pretty quickly. My own office place uh, just outside St. Paul uh, was a relatively conservative office place. You know, I, was, I was very much in the minority there. Um, and so it is, it's a lot of, you know, go along to get along, sort of don't be aggressive at work. And... I'm not a terribly shy person. Exactly, that's not your personality at all. <laughs> and so there's there's a there's a challenge there in because I'm legitimately outraged by these things. It's not a oh well this seems pretty disappointing. Like I am furious about the postal service. I mean this is this is him doing what he said in the election. He's stepping out onto Fifth Avenue and shooting someone, and no one's doing anything. Um, but I couldn't come out and say that at work because then I'm honestly the one creating a hostile work environment. Mm -hmm. But if folks 
ever wanted to actually talk to capital T them, they would come to the front desk and ask a question. And then they'd get the half hour explanation that had been bottled up and it would just come rushing out at them. Yeah. Um, you were right in the middle. I mean, many, I mean, when I think about Minnesota, that's, that's where uh, the George Floyd thing happened. I mean, wasn't so that, that was George, George Floyd died uh, 12 blocks from my apartment and oh. the third precinct was a mile away. The target that burned down was my target. Uh, like that's, that was my store that I went right. to. Right. You know, wow. That's where I would go get my emergency bananas. Um, they burned down my my Walgreens. I was I was using that. Um, it was it was a lot. You know those those couple of those couple of weeks uh, after it became clear they weren't going to arrest his murderers. Um, we were on night patrol at our apartment. We the residents of our apartment building uh, were taking shifts so that. Uh, we didn't we didn't get uh, vandalized or burned down wow wow that's that's heavy that's real heavy but but that's also the stuff that doesn't get reported out right right absolutely some windows in our in our neighborhood got burned down uh, got i uh, got bashed in and our liquor store got looted um but also the neighborhood was on a discord server the entire time and keeping each other updated and the news went back and forth and everybody's taking care of each other and there wasn't a, a quarter as much violence as got reported out because they're using the same eight pictures the entire time. And they'll report the 18, 20 people who are, who are doing violence to make a point, but they won't right. report the, the you know, 1,500 people <clears throat> down at the Floyd Memorial peacefully singing and, you know, protesting in the middle of the street you know, it all becomes about the story and the story in minneapolis was honestly largely unifying mm -hmm. but that's not what gets reported out which made it easier when they started talking about seattle and portland to not give in to the alarmism yeah but then they also lost interest so it's been weird well yeah no an auto zone burning down is is a lot more interesting than uh, people seeing each other come to the street. Yeah. yeah, which helps the Republicans. You know, they can say, "Oh, these are rioters," but you know, not not protesters. And it's 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 really disheartening. It's funny. I had a flashback when you were talking about that, Travis. I remember my granddad talking about you know when he had to worry about when he still lived in the Deep South, the Klan, and worries about lynching and being having to be on patrol. Um, you know, so that your place don't get burned down. I, I, for whatever reason, I had a flashback of that. So when we talk about violence and peace or whatever, I mean, it, it goes across all sorts of cultures. Um, but also, but also just the, the culture of fear around it. No one was ever going to hurt our building mm. in, in a million years. We were a mile away from anything they were doing. We're a mile from the third precinct, which is where, you know, the first couple of nights of violence was. And they weren't ever going to come and hurt our apartment. But there was a fear in the apartment, in the, in the complex, there were 44 units, uh, that they would. And so we right. set up patrols because it made, it made those folks feel better to know that someone was looking out at the door. But I had to laugh. You're talking about flashbacks. The last time I'd been on a street actively patrolling anything for anyone uh, was when I worked at the exit. Uh, oh. When I was the assistant production manager at the exit, standing guard outside Taylor, or standing guard outside the main stage. Yeah. Uh, you know, line. Every every weekend. Keeping the homeless out? Was that what it was? Yeah. Keeping the homeless out, making sure they were, you know, well supplied with cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I, I, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> well, this is a good enough time as any to segue into an origin story. I mean, we've already yeah. talked about how you guys came to the Bay Area, but. How did each of you get involved in theater? I mean, um, Al, you know, let's let's begin with uh, let's begin with you. Uh, actually, Bob, um, how, what were you were you a type of kid that uh, got involved in theater when you were young? Uh, well, I was young when I got involved in theater. Um, it was uh, my freshman year in high school, and before that, and even while getting involved in theater, I was not the type of person that I would have expected to get involved in theater. 
I was shy, I was uh, nervous, I was uh, quiet, and uh, uh, this, uh, a friend of mine in high school, he was a junior, I was a freshman, um, said, hey, you should come audition for the show. And I thought, that's ridiculous. I'm, I'm not going to audition for a show. And he was referring to the musical. And I oh. certainly was not going to apply to <laughs> the, uh, the musical. Uh, but for some reason, uh, he was able to uh, get me in there. And I auditioned, and I got a small part in Pippin um, and the understudy role of Theo in Pippin. Mm. And, uh, and I can still remember being on stage that first, uh, first show uh, as the, uh, the organ music is playing. It, the lights are down and a spotlight starts to go on our hands as we're moving around going Ooh. and I was bit I was I was hooked and from there on theater's been the focus of my life um, I, I, I plan to do uh, music uh, and teach music but when I filled out my application to the University of New Hampshire I wrote theater is my major and it's it's been theater ever since. Wow. How about you, Travis? How, how did you, uh, now you, I mean, I'm sure it's the opposite. I'm sure you were probably on the stage, you know, almost getting out of the wound. <laughs> the, uh, everyone thought that I should be. Uh, I honestly, event, the first time I took any sort of performance class was through a community group. And it was literally because everybody had said, oh, you'd be such a good actor because, you know, I was loud and not terribly <laughs> shy. Um, the, for most of high school, I was, I was the church kid. I was a leader in two youth groups and, you know, I planned on being a pastor, um, still performing, uh, just performing with a, with a different text. Um, but coming out of that performance class, that performance class, uh, there were a group of six of us who were all uh, freshmen or sophomores in high school. And out of that group of six, there are uh, two people with their master's in theater, uh, one with their PhD in theater, and one who's a professional actor uh, for 15 years before he got tired of it. And me with whatever <clears throat> career we've had, like out of that group of six, it was just a radically committed group. So when I got back to high school uh, and they were doing a show, uh, I felt like they had said, well, okay, this group is good enough to do things with. And so I did Alice in Wonderland at the end of my sophomore year. Um, and at the top of my junior year, I had to decide between playing baseball, between going out for baseball and auditioning for Midsummer. And I auditioned for Midsummer, got cast as bottom and, uh, well, I mean, once you've played bottom, you really can't go back. That's as much yeah. fun as you can have. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was 25 years ago, and here we are. Yeah. How did you guys, uh, you, how did you guys meet? You guys met at the University of New Hampshire? Bob, you tell this one better than I do. <laughs> uh, oh, I, are you sure? Okay. <laughs> yes. So it was uh, June of uh, 93, I believe. Yeah. Um, we, uh, from my perspective, I was up at uh, the uh, uh, what is what's the what's the word for it? Uh, the freshman days. Just, what it was it? Freshman days. Freshman days. Um, so it's where they kind of tour you around the campus and all that stuff as an incoming freshman to UNH, and uh, you get to see the campus and all that stuff, and. Um, I had a friend from high school that I was with. Her name was Heather. And uh, we were staying at one of the main dorm buildings uh, there. And did, did she invite you into the van? Or uh, She did. Her, her mother was an art teacher at my high school. Right. And so we had a, we had a vague knowledge of one another. So and yes, was, she invited me yeah. to the van. So it was a girl that I went to high school with who was going to UNH. Uh, I had the family minivan, which was a red Aerostar um, that uh, was lovingly called the Zikmobile or uh, the Hamstermobile because it, uh, it was falling apart. But 
anyway, uh, she invites him into the, the van, and the next thing I know, he's digging under the seats and finds some baseball cards and <laughs> starts asking me about the baseball cards. I didn't really know who, uh, well, anything about Travis at that time. <laughs> but from that point on, uh, he was he became a uh, a uh, a partner in the uh, the theater world in the theater classes, a roommate in the dorms over in uh, the the quad in was it Hunter, it was. Um, and, uh, and and friends from that day onward. One of the cool things about the two of you, I mean, when you guys came to the bay. The skill set that both of you have are, was just amazing. I mean, you built sets, you you directed, you acted. I mean, each of you could, you know, start a theater company from scratch from the very top. I mean, did you learn all of that from, I'm, I'm asking the both of you, at the University of New Hampshire? I mean, you learned pretty much everything. I mean, building sets, lighting, sound, everything. Yeah, I'd there was there was a it's a liberal arts school, not a conservatory. And there was a, a very real expectation uh, that you would learn how to do a little bit of everything. And, you know, I think I think Bob would feel the same way. There was very much uh, a push for students to have ownership, even of the department productions uh, that we were uh, peers. We were junior peers, but peers with the faculty and that we would be doing that we wouldn't be in a classroom for a couple of years before we did shows. Uh, and uh, I don't remember the specifics for Bob, but actually the doing is what got me in trouble in college because I would be doing three, four, five shows at a time and you can't actually actively take a 20, 24 hour class load and do five shows at a time. Physics won't allow it. Uh, <laughs> you are too good. <laughs> the, Getting the, cast already. Oh, ca casting, student groups, student shows, department shows. Uh, yeah. you, know, you just did as much as you could. It, it, it took six years to graduate from uh, UNH for me. It was only five for me. You, yeah, you were better at it than me. <laughs> <laughs> but there was, there was, there was very much an expectation that you would do a little bit of everything and maybe you would focus more on the things you were better at or the things that you enjoyed more. Um, but even for, at that point, even for performers, the primary method of fellowship was as a technical assistant. Mm -hmm. So you may be, you know, the performing star for the department, but if you want a scholarship for the department, you're gonna be doing you know, 12 to 18 shop hours a week, and you're going to have a specific position on each department show, whether that's master carpenter or master electrician, or whether you're going to, you know, given a skill set, whether you're going to design. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's, I can't speak to the generations after us, but our generation, you know, sort of the, the eight years around us, that's really what folks came out with. Yeah, there's, it's such a selfless way of looking at theater. A lot of people jump into, let's say, a theater course <clears throat> or become theater majors because they want to be on stage. They want to be the superstar. They well, yeah. want to hit them. And to have the idea of, you know, we're going to join this thing and we're going to build, you know, sets and we're going to do, you know, we're going to get our hands dirty and do the, you know, and get paint all over ourselves. Mm -hmm. And this is what theater is really all about. Bob, can you talk about your perspective? Because, uh, you know, when you came to East Enders, I mean, you were the master builder. You sort of did a little bit of. I was everything. going to say this is the perfect setup for working at East Enders. <laughs> yeah. Well, so East Enders, uh, I was actually hired for the first uh, uh, the first production I did with them to direct uh, a slight ache. Uh, Pinter was my guy, and when they said they were doing these one-act plays, and Pinter was one of them, I got, I was, I was thrilled at the possibility of uh, of working with them. And from that moment, uh, it, it was uh, it was just a, a joy to work with them because you could go in there, you work on a project. They had, uh, I was the new guy then. This was, gosh, what year was this? This was two thousand and one, I think. 2002? 
Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I remember you, well, you and I had worked together. Of course, we did Bay Stage. We could talk about Bay Stage, but right. I remember you did uh, Sick. You yep. Were, no, you were in Sick. Uh, yep. Uh, for that series, which one did I? Uh, yeah, I was, I played, I think, was it Frank in Sick? I can't remember the character's name, but um, I, because the slight ache, that was before my time. I think I was probably still working on Bay Stage, but you and I also, remember Isis Arts Collective working yep. with um, the late Mike Ward? Yep. Uh, yeah, brother. Poster, uh, yeah, Summer Shorts, right here. Oh, <laughs> yeah, we, we had such a wonderful group of people to work with there. Uh, from EastEnders Bay Stages, where we originally met. Um, and uh, then it was uh, EastEnders working on uh, a slight ache, and from there being able to uh, work with them on designing and uh, acting and directing, of uh, designing sets and designing lights. Um, I think you and I, Reg, worked at Thick Description uh, for at least one show. Um, uh, and uh, was it? Yeah, I think it, it was the Thick House. I think it was a Four Monologues, Three Hotels. John yeah. Rock Bates. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's now the Potrero Hill uh, um, Theater. Is it Theater Works? No. Um, play, playground. Playground it has taken taken over that now. Okay. Is Tony Kelly still there? Hey Norman, can you want to kick in? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> no. My wife is is playing trombone upstairs, so I'm going to keep riding my mute button. <laughs> no, no, Tony's, no, Tony has, um, I don't know if you guys follow him at all. He's got political aspirations now. So yeah. he's very much a neighborhood activist and has run at least twice for the Board of Supervisors and has some really strong support. But yeah, he's, he still directs. He'll direct down in the South Bay, but you know, he's not producing anymore. Yeah, okay. and he's not involved with the, uh, the they don't call it Thick House anymore now. They call it Potrero Stage. Okay. He's not at all involved. But it still looks the same. And uh, yeah, so, yeah. but um, Bob, I mean, you know, Travis talked about his philosophy. Uh, is, is, was that your philosophy as well, that theater is not just being on stage, but sort of being, uh, you know, the fuller part of building good repertory theater? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I work with my students on, that uh, we all work together to to build our shows. Um, you work on stage, you work off stage, and you develop these skills that are going to be lifelong skills uh, that I can come into my uh, home and uh, and uh, build something is is beneficial. And it's because of my theater background. I mean, all of these skills are uh, are beneficial on stage, behind the scenes, and in real life. Travis, I want to I want to brag about you because I, I think you are just a, a magnificent actor. I still remember um, what was it was um, we were doing the Shum Shorts Cross Wires, and um, you were playing a beast. You were uh, I forget the the show. What Living with the savage. Dawson the Moore. savage. The <laughs> savage. Yeah. And uh, and also when we did um, Water Buffalo, which is still one of my favorite shows, um, you know, you were Gita Ukraine, and uh, you the type of, <laughs> the type of acting it's it's uh, it's almost abstract theater or surrealism theater, but I mean you could sort of do it all. What type of acting training did you specifically have? And what is your um, I mean, did you get into beats and I mean, do you have like a sort of a method? to how you approach, um, approach a play? Uh, my training was actually really interesting because of when I showed up to UNH. Uh, if you had shown up before our time period, you would have worked with two professors your entire time, acting one through acting three and a half and directing. They would have been your professors um, and they would have taught your method. They've been teaching since 65. Uh, it was going to be modified Stanislavski and uh, a little bit of Michael Chekhov, and that's it. Um, but where we ended up was sort of on a seam in where the department uh, was staff-wise. So for acting three, uh, acting one through three, uh, and I took three twice, I had four different teachers with four different acting philosophies. 
so I was I was exposed to Uta Hagen and Michael Chekhov and Stanislavski and a whole bunch of Meisner. Uh, Meisner was just going through his renaissance at that point in terms of ed educational pedagogy. Um, and, and so I got to pick and choose the tools of that that were useful for me. Um, and I think in the, in the same way that, that building the broader theater skill set is useful, uh, I think that's a super useful way to build an actor, uh, is, is handing them tools to use rather than a specific process. Uh, I've, I've worked with folks who have very specific processes and uh, I find that other people tend to get in the way of that. Uh, whereas having specific tools to deal with whether you're doing emotional recall or whether you need a show that is more physically based, you have the tools to attack that each individual problem rather than receiving a text, you deal with the text in the same way for each text. Uh, so I can attack, my last couple of years in Austin, I was primarily doing uh, Shakespeare and puppets, uh, American tabletop puppetry with, with Trouble Puppet in Austin. And you could attack either of those texts with the same tool set as opposed to dealing with it from a, a really specific emotional method and working each beat that way. Uh, One quick question for you, Travis. Um, and this is something that Norman and I have talked uh, with other guests. Do you find that you've learned more as an actor offstage just with life and just, you know, getting on stage? Or do you still recall a lot of the things that you've learned from teaching? Um, you know, there are a lot of people who would think, do I need to go to acting school or can I just, you know, get on stage? What do you think? Have you learned more from school or from life? Uh, I, the third space, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, I actually took a huge leap in terms of who I am as a performer uh, when I stopped producing as actively. And rather than performing in one or two shows a year, I was performing in five or six shows a year. And so I was actively getting the reps I needed to, to be able to muscularly work through a role, as opposed to sort of hanging on and getting a role prepared just in time because I was in amateur shape. I was in a much more professional shape in terms of, uh, in terms of working a role uh, and being able to make really mindful choices with it. So for me, life fills the tank in terms of what I'm, what I'm feeling, what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, the art I'm seeing, which will change the angle I'm approaching a show at because I have more or less knowledge on a given thing. And the training is the set of tools I bring to it. But in terms of, in terms of what I would say to an actor is you need to be on stage. You need to be in a room relating to folks because it's different than reading a script at home. And you need to be working in that difference to get better at doing this. Yeah, I like that analogy, being in game shape. Um, it's, I think it's uh, prevalent. Uh, what do you think, Bob? And Bob, you've done more directing. I mean, do you still direct now? I do, well, I direct my students. That's the, the change in my life. Uh, over the last 10 years, um, uh, when I moved, when I started teaching high school, uh, that has taken all of my uh, time, focus, and energy. Um, and I find this actually a little bit funny because I have uh, English teacher friends who are able to teach their English classes and then uh, go out and audition and do shows after school while I don't have that luxury. I don't have that <laughs> opportunity to go out and do my own thing uh, outside of school. So uh, right now I work with kids on directing the plays there, work with them on designing the plays. Um, and I think what Travis was talking about with uh, developing that, uh, that toolkit uh, of, uh, of uh, methods and practices that they can learn and then 
connect their life uh, or use their life experiences to connect to that and then work and work and work and work and work on stage is what really uh, helps them grow. Um, so uh, I kind of feel like now my, uh, my job is to um, build those, uh, those toolboxes, to provide them with the background material, open their eyes to um, the, uh, the world around them saying that you can't play this role if you're not aware of what's going on in the world around you. Um, and then giving them the opportunities to play with the, the material, uh, to play with new scripts, uh, play with old scripts, uh, Shakespeare. We've done Pinter even in high school. Um, <laughs> we write plays. And uh, I, I want to give them as much opportunity to, uh, to play, grow, and then continue on if they choose to after high school. No, that's really, really cool. Um, what have you... What, what are some of the memories, I mean, I guess, good memories, bad memories, strange memories that you have of being uh, in the Bay? Um, I'll just throw it out there. Let me, let me, let me toss something else in there, though. Because um, I know as a teacher, those ideas that I think are really key or useful to give anybody, not, you know, not just somebody focused on theater, when I'm suddenly put back in the position of doing theater, how many times do you find yourself hearing those lessons that you've been trying to impart you're like, oh yeah, duh, I remember. That's what I'm always telling my students. How often yeah. does that come up? That's sort of ridiculously true. Uh, the last two years I've been, I've been teaching Shakespeare uh, to some incarcerated men. Uh, wow. Minnesota Correctional Facility at Moose Lake. And you teach them really basic performing principles and then you remember that you haven't done that in like three years. Like maybe, maybe I should get back to doing that a little bit. Uh, there was stuff that I dropped out of my warm up practice uh, for expediency that I was telling these men are super important. And, oh yeah, no, I should, I should get back to doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um... Fortunately for me, I get to do the uh, the uh, warm up routines every day with the with the kids, um, and and that's nice. Uh, the thing that I that echoes in my head is uh, I want to get out there and be doing auditioning. I want to get out and uh, and do some of the work that I'm working with these kids on. Um, this last year, uh, I signed up again for Backstage Magazine to see if I could find some things that I could audition for. Uh, because it is, I don't feel like right now I'm uh, leading by the example that I want to with my kids that we had these, uh, we should be practicing these things. And if I become dull in, uh, in my ability to perform, in my ability to uh, get up on stage, uh, then I might not be providing the best education for the students. Um, one area that I found really tricky is uh, the Meisner exercises. When we try to do that, um, uh, when I, a few years ago, uh, while I was teaching, I did take some acting classes on my own and realized as I was going through the, the Meisner class, it was getting a little too real for me. I was being affected, like it was... Uh, really emotional for me to be going through this class. And then when I went into my own class to teach that, um, I had to step back because I would lose control of my ability to teach in that class. And in a high school class, generally you don't want to um, <laughs> lose all sense of control for, for myself uh, in there. Um, so I had to step back and and kind of try to lead it from the outside rather than being in it. And uh, that's one of the things that I want to continue to work on, trying to figure out how I can uh, continue to grow as an artist myself and, uh, and still teach uh, the students without, uh, uh, well, maybe it is a, a question of, uh, do I need to give up control uh, in the classroom so that we can pursue uh, these emotions or whatever it might be that's coming up through, uh, through the performance. Um, that's one of the things that I'm dealing with. 
No, I find it uh, fascinating. You know, we've talked a lot on the A about control. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have technique, whether it be Meisner or Stanislavski or, um, you know, whatever it may be to sort of ground us on the stage so that we're not just emoting. I remember, Norman, you had a wonderful story about a student who is in a class and uh, the teacher tells the student, you know, find a, a ring. On the oh, right. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's Stanislavski. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you can tell the story again because it's all about emoting rather than feeling the emotion, you know. Um, well, I, I find it a difficult lesson to teach because you're, you're almost cruel <laughs> if you do this, where the student is given the assignment of finding a, a valuable ring or piece of jewelry in the, on stage, in the room, and she rushes around and she looks and she can't find it. And, but she's been acting her butt off the whole time. And she comes back down and she's, they say, how do you feel? And she says, I feel great. And they ask the other students, what did they see? And they all come up with the right language for, you know, oh yes, nice job. And he says, well, so where is it? And she says, what? And he said, there really is something up there. And if you don't find it, you're gonna be out of this program. And she suddenly runs up there and she tears the stage up keeps going to the same place, takes those moments of just, what am I going to do? So there's no acting happening at all. She comes down flushed, nearly in tears, turns to the audience, you know, to the, ca the rest of the class and says, so how did that <laughs> compare? And there's no comparison. Bringing that thing to life is wonderful. But I, I when I'm teaching, I, I really want to take care of my students. Mm -hmm. You know, I, what I lost a long time ago was the notion that I was going to find the next, you know, whatever, um, Olivier. You know, um, those people are going to find their own paths. That is not my job. <laughs> my job is to give them an experience where they can find those, those core values that are part of theater, where they can get in touch with themselves by, through the process of that. Yeah, you know, I, I, and I brought the, the story up because it's such a fantastic story of sort of being real on stage uh, as opposed to, you know, sort of just acting. And I think that's what the job of technique is all about. Not that one technique is better than the other, but whatever will ground you. Um, because we've also talked about, and it's something that Susan Evans and I had sort of talked about, how real do you need to be on stage or do you just need to do it just enough so that the audience can buy what you're doing? Oh, and <laughs> I sort of, I, you know, I'm sort of more into the method thing, whereas, hey, I want it to be as real as possible. I don't need to be a serial killer, mm -hmm. but I need to have those emotions connected as so much that I'm into it. And I'm not, you know, there's the, the fourth wall is really there. Um, what do you guys think as far as that's concerned? I mean, how real do you need to be on stage or do you just need to be as real as what the audience can buy? Or did that most real reaction? I'll, I'll yeah, no. go, Bob. <laughs> What's that? I'll I'll go. I, I was just I was letting you go first. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I just want to share a moment that, and I talked to my students about this. This was uh, when I was in uh, at UNH uh, performing a play, uh, the uh, betrayal, and playing the character of Robert. And there was a moment on stage when uh, Robert learns that his wife has been having an affair with his best friend for, um, for five years. Um, and uh, he's on vacation with, uh, with his wife and uh, confronts her. And when she reveals that it's been five years and he, he uh, responds that, it was, uh, that their son is four years old and he's questioning in his mind whether the son is his or not, I had this moment on stage that was the realest moment I've ever had on stage, uh, I'd say ever. Uh, it was a moment where I wanted to throw what was in my hand, a glass, and I couldn't in that moment for the character's sake, I would, he, he thrives on control. And so I'm holding it and I'm feeling this energy move through me. And for me, that was uh, completely real, completely honest and uh, perfect for that character in that moment. And if I could relive that moment every day on stage, I would. If that, that truthfulness, that, that realism was happening on stage every moment, I think that would be amazing. Uh, I work in high school theater now, and 
finding that realism is really, really challenging. Um, students are not, uh, I don't think, developed uh, quite enough to uh, experience that feeling on stage or express that feeling on stage. And uh, uh, so I think theater is still relevant without it being um, that truthfully honest. It's still powerful, uh, but I think it sh that should be the goal that we're aiming for. We're aiming for that truthfulness, that sense of, uh, uh, of intensity on stage. And if we could accomplish that, I think uh, that we've done our job. Yeah. Uh, I think there are, there are a, a kind of couple answers to that. I think it, it depends on the show you're doing. It depends on what you're trying to do to an audience. Um, I think, you know, we talked about, about Water Buffalo. We mentioned Water Buffalo earlier, you know, and Gita Ukraine is, uh, uh, performance artists in a in a fairly realistic mimetic world, and the character is meant to be surreal. And so, there, there, if there is a reality there, you're sort of warping what that's meant to be. If you're doing something like Pinter, you're aiming for mimesis, and that reality is part of your goal. Uh, I think if that emotional reality is your goal in every moment, we run into a real problem because the method we don't teach any performer, because there isn't a method that exists, is how to abandon that emotion that you've enacted on stage once you're done. Mm. Uh, our texts are largely based in trauma. And so we're asking our performers to reenact trauma in their bodies every night as realistically as they can and then go home. Yeah. And, and so there's, there's, I struggle with the idea that we're looking for emotional amnesis in every moment because I think we're asking a lot of ourselves and of our coworkers to go through that every night for, you know, a $200 stipend. <laughs> um, the they're the best moments when when you're in that moment of complete emotional honesty with another person uh, for me those are almost spiritual uh, there was a moment uh, in performing Richard II uh, we pour shadows of Elysium on Richard Garriott's stage uh just off the Colorado River, uh, and it's a uh, scale version of the globe. Uh, it's a thrust stage with the wooden O around you. And I was playing John O'Gant, and in the middle of John O'Gant's one really great scene, uh, there's just a moment standing all the way downstage on that thrust, looking out at the Colorado River and these people in the O, on breath, doing the verse, and I just, you feel rooted to the core of the earth in those moments, and I don't know why you'd pass it up. But then the idea of living through what your body wreck feels is your parents' death over and over again in a realistic show every night for two months is a lot. And if you can get away with not reenacting the trauma, should you do that for your own self-care if the audience can't tell the difference? I, I honestly don't know. That's a, like, that's where, what my brain is working at in, in mm -hmm. this moment uh, as something to, to solve for performers because we don't have a method for step down. We send people out, they reenact the trauma and then they go have two, three bourbons and go home. I hear you. Mm -hmm. Norma, <clears throat> Norma, what's your take as a director and even as an actor? I mean, as far as how grounded do you need to be? Well, grounded, yes. Um, and it's funny because, you know, method, when method became a, 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 a technique, a style, um, I think that's the reason people make fun of it. Uh, because 
what's there, what's core, what's real is that moment of being grounded, being real, being in the moment so that when you accidentally do something and stay in character and make that discovery in front of an audience, oh, it's glorious. Um, but I think part of our job as a director is we need something that's replicable. We need mm -hmm. to give them a structure that is replicable, not somebody trying to imitate what they did that was beautiful the other night, but to hold on to it, to find some way to ground it. And I, I as a director, I'm always just going to go wherever I can get my performers to go. If that's all you're going to give me, then we talked about it with the, uh, the reading that we just did last month, uh, Maddie May, where one of the lead characters, the actor is a very proud out gay man. The character isn't designated that, but there's no reason. There's nothing in the script that contradicts that reality. And the character is a preacher, right? Yeah, so, but hey, it's out there. It's, you know, it exists. So I'm like, I'm not gonna tell this actor what he can and cannot do. I'm gonna wait and see what he brings to it. And I, I love that. Um, the other hat that I wear, and I just finished uh, doing, oh, Reg, you don't know this. <laughs> I, I've been on the selection committee for Playground <clears throat> for the upcoming season. And so we've been talking about all the submissions and you guys don't know it, but Reg has submitted. Um, so I can't really talk about that directly, but what I can say is when I read a piece and I feel like it's predictable, then I'm assuming as director, what I'm worried about is, is this gonna be predictable for my audience? Or is there something that the playwright is trying to get to and taking us down a path and hopefully will give us something that doesn't, isn't just predictable. Uh -oh. And there were a few you pieces that? that I was ready to write them off and I'd get to the last page mm -hmm. and something would happen and I'd be like, oh. And I actually had to get up at one point. My wife said, are you okay? Because I walked into the other room and I was almost in tears. And I was like, wow, I, I don't know if the rest of that play, it, the rest of it felt predictable or if the playwright was intentionally setting us up. I don't know. And it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, I just need to craft something that is replicable and that is going to affect an audience. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as an actor, I want to see if I can find that for myself. As a director, I I'm really feel like I'm limited by the material I'm dealing with, including the talent. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because uh, you can only and you're you, you know the work that can the work that you do as a director is only as good as what the actor can bring to you. If I'm an actor, um, you know I, I've got a talent and I'm connected with the script. That's the reason why I audition. So obviously I'm saying, hey, I, there's something that I can bring to the script. Um, yeah, as far as method acting is concerned, it really, my, my take is that it's got to be something, I don't know if grounded, yeah, grounded is, I guess, the operative word, and something that can be repetitive, uh, something that I can do night after night after night. But I really do, as an actor, want to be as real as possible without going, you know, beyond the line. Um, and it also has to be within the scope of the play. And within the scope of my relationship with whoever I'm acting with, you know, my scene partner or what have you. But I just wanted to get your guys' perspective on what you think about technique and all that stuff. I want to be respectful of people's time. Do, do we have to go? Should we wrap it up? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just hanging out with some folks talking acting. <laughs> <laughs> Norman, how are you feeling? <laughs> I, I'm okay. I mean, I think if we start to wrap sometime soon, it's fine. We're, I'm good. Yeah. Um, as, as uh, um, Bob, I wanted to ask you as a director, have you, because I've asked a bunch of directors who have been on the show, have you had to deal with difficult actors, actors who are either buttholes <laughs> or it's like, listen, you're not getting where I want you to go. And uh, I mean, of course you'll deal with- Oh, come on, that never happens with students. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, both as far as students and even going back to your days, you know, working uh, as a director, either for EastEnders or ISIS Arts Collective or whatever, what, what bad experiences have you had or just difficult experiences dealing with uh, actors as a director? Um, it, it's, it would be difficult to go into specifics, but uh, yeah, you're always going to deal with different uh, I remember uh, one time you, you wanted to fight the director. What's that? I remember uh, uh, there was a play that you wanted to fight the director. You are the nicest guy that I know. 
Do you remember this? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't think I would want to fight with the director. Uh, is this Water Buffalo? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not Water saying Buffalo I still is... want to fight the director, but I'm I'm game. Uh, <laughs> in any case, let me not distract you. Go ahead. No, uh, um, you're always dealing with different uh, different personalities and things like that. Um, there were a couple challenges that I had in New York when, so in New York, I founded a theater company with a few friends uh, called New World Theater. And the first production that uh, uh, I did there was uh, Book of Days by Lanford Wilson. And there was, uh, I hired the actors, uh, paid all of the actors to be a part of the show. And uh, one actor who was a wonderfully talented but uh, could not, uh, was difficult to work with in that um, uh, I'm paying the actors out of my pocket. Uh, I'm trying to do this as professionally as possible, um, but we're still not a, uh, a union play. We're not a union production and was, uh, was requesting things that were along those lines of a union production. And while I, uh, I sympathize uh, with the uh, the desire to have those professional levels. Um, we weren't uh, we weren't able to accommodate that, and so it became a struggle that was impacting how we were going to get the 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 show mounted in in the first place. Um, eventually, talking? everything was didn't he work making, out. Was he making mm -hmm. unreasonable demands? Is that what was going on? Uh, it, in in some ways, demands like for a uh, a, uh, a a private uh, a dressing room, things like that, and I I couldn't accommodate those things. Um, we did the best that we could, and uh, and uh, like I said, the show uh, the show went on. We were we were able to get everything on on stage the way we wanted it, and he was a professional performer on stage. But it was a challenge going through the uh, the working process with him. Um, and then, yeah, in high school theater, you've got a variety of levels. You've got some kids with no experience that are on stage for the very first time. And uh, this will probably be the last time that they're on stage, um, uh, or possibly be the last time they're on stage. Uh, the, I think the bigger issue that you come across in high school theater is uh, the input from uh, the people outside of the uh, <laughs> what's going on on stage. The parents yeah. sometimes uh, can uh, can drive you crazy. Uh, budget constraints, uh, 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 the material can uh, be questionable for uh, or can cause questions for uh, the public if you do something like we did uh, a production of uh, the the um, uh, the original version of Spring Awakening, and that was uh, I, I remember going to my principal saying, "This is a, the play the students have uh, chosen. It's uh, it's aimed for students of for people of this age group, um, and but it's going to potentially cause problems with the community." Fortunately, our principal was on board. He said, "Just." Put out a letter to uh, the students' families that if they want to be involved, they sign this, and you're all set. Um, but those are some of the challenges that you face in high school theater. Travis, what about you? I'm sure you've been a director, but also as an actor, have you had to deal with difficult directors where a director is giving you direction, and you're like, "I don't know what's going on here. Why are you asking me to do this?" I think the the interesting thing about uh, getting older and doing uh, semi-professional theater uh, and lower resourced professional theater is that the directors largely stay the same age and you get older. Uh, and you start getting to a point where uh, they're trying things that you know won't work because you've been there and you've tried that and you find yourself trying to not be the difficult actor. Uh, as, you, as you slide into having, say, double the experience that your director has, trying to, in good faith, 
go through their process with them because they're doing the best they can to be an advocate for the text and be an advocate for the company that's chosen the text, but you know better. And not, not in an egotistical way, you legitimately do, just because you, you have double the years on them. Um, and so trying to, trying not to be that performer who's pushing back too hard, to try and be in the show that's going up uh, and not the show in your head and to not try to direct from the stage. Um, I've, been, I've been blessed to work with, uh, by and large, directors that I really respect. Uh, and uh, those, those directors I've had to work with that I didn't respect, uh, the cast all disrespected the director equally. So we just directed ourselves at the bar later and disrespected him out loud. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes that happens. <laughs> I've always felt that, you know, the best directors, and uh, I recently worked with a young, young director who uh, was just coming out of college, and I could sort of tell, okay, there's going to be some learning curves, but usually I'm like, okay, let me just wait until the crash happens, or when bad things happen, then I could say, well, okay, so this is sort of what happened or whatever. I was in the capacity of a stage manager. But uh, it is a learning curve. But the best directors, I, I think, are the ones who are true collaborators. They're like, hey, listen, this is my idea, but tell me what you think. Will it work? Will it not work? Or I've given you a direction and it's not really working. There's always that level of, of communication, which is always there. It's like a highway. You know, it flows both ways. And, um, and the best directors really respect the actors. I think the worst directors who have this great idea and just say, hey, do what I tell you to do. Those are the ones who don't ask the actor, hey, is it working or is it not working? And that's when you run into real problems. Well, you've got to remember it's a collaborative process. Mm -hmm. So as much as I've got my ideas about what I want this to be, I've got to deal with that talent that's in front of me. Yep, exactly. And with that, um, shall we get into uh, shout outs? Because we don't want to run into an hour and a half. Shout outs, birthdays. Birthdays. Uh, Jonathan Bellman, um, it's funny, I knew him in high school, um, and he was, a, he was a piano player, is a piano player. He now teaches, I think, for the University of Colorado or something. And it's amazing to think of that snarky teenager that I know now being that wise, old, slightly snarky professor. But um, his birthday is today. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, do you know Gabriel Kinney, Reg? Uh, let me unmute. No, I uh, maybe if I saw his or her face. Okay, uh, young. He's a young guy. Well, youngish. He's he's hitting a big O this year, which to me is a funny. It's oh, okay, you're not really a kid anymore. That's all that means. But for him, it's like oh, I'm turning thirty. Like he, he, oh yes, gosh, that's 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 horribly old. Gosh, you old man. <laughs> Wonderful performer, musical theater. Um, Lynn Abadia. Um, is a Filipina who uh, got to do uh, the lead in Jeannie Baroga's Banyan that we did in, gosh, 2009. So again, maybe she's not as young as she was in my memory. Um, and I'm going to skip one because I think you've got her. Uh, ben Yalom um, uh, is one of the uh, founders of Fool's Fury Theater. Um, they do a lot of uh, devised theater. They create work um, and a lot of workshops. There are a lot of Bay Area actors who've gotten to develop their performance technique through them. Uh, Jerry Thompson, and his name is always listed as Jerry Thompson Thompson. I don't know if he just that, does that online or if that's actually his name. But um, he's not a theater person. He is, uh, he was um, involved with, they used to bring theater organizations to a bookstore in San Francisco, Alexander Books. And he was the contact person who sort of um, curated that program. So I've always considered him to be somebody important in theater. Mark Ruthier, Bay Area director, um, such a hardcore kind of guy when you meet him, but the kind of guy who also will do anything for you. You know, when you meet him and you're kind of put off by, wow, you're hard. And then you learn how much he will give to make sure you're, you are taken care of and the production is going to get where it needs to be. Wonderful director. Rena Beth Apostol, another Filipina. Um, who I think I first saw through Bendelstiff, but she's been working all over the Bay. Amazing performer. 
And my, is that my last one? No, I've got a bunch more. Theodore Chin, um, Asian American actor who started a theater company here with a couple of other guys and then immediately moved to LA. So I, I hope he's still doing theater. Uh, Alinda Amayo Hassan is a playwright who, and I had to, I was like, wait a minute, Linda. Yeah, I just saw her name. She's in the pool for, uh, for um, playground playwrights. We'll yeah. see what happens. And a teacher at Sugar Bowl College and one of our guests on the A. She wrote a cheer story of a dreamer. Cool no. Um, Stephanie Ann Johnson is amazing lighting designer here. She has actually done um, some gallery exhibits of her work. That's how incredible her lighting design is. Uh, Todd Duncan is uh, somebody who I normally wouldn't think of as a theater guy, but we were in the service together. And he reminds me that I convinced him to do one of the shows. I'm like, oh, I hope you had a good time. Uh, Nick Shawley is uh, somebody I knew as an actor, but he's now very prominent up in North Bay Theater, uh, Santa Rosa area, uh, directs as well as acts. And he stewart as casting director for the uh, SF Playground. Um, and Anna, I've got a lot, couple more. Anna Maria Luara, I will always think of as my sister because we did the school tour of the House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. And they, the show was so popular, they brought it back time and again over four years. <laughs> Finally, on the last tour, she dropped out and they had us do like over 80 shows. And at that point, even all, I think we were all like, okay, we're done with this. But you really make a bond with somebody that way. And finally, Andoni uh, Panici. Andoni is um, somebody who also doesn't think of himself as an actor. He's a musician. We were in a musical. They created a musical for Golden Thread Theater called The Love Missile, about a country, a fictional country that had created a missile that made everybody fall in love, but it was made out of shit. <laughs> so we couldn't say that in the play. We always found interesting ways to do it. And then when we finally had to do the bombing mo moment, we did it with like, Pillsbury frosting, chocolate frosting. <laughs> hmm. So from the audience, it looked gross as hell. And on stage, we all were trying to get our fingers in it. Anyway, <laughs> birthday shout outs for this week. I, was, I just said, I hate to be the stage and I'd have to clean up after that. <laughs> oh, I was so apologetic. As a director, sometimes I'm looking at my stage manager going, I am so sorry, but this works. And yeah. Okay, my list, uh, Lauren Grace, and she was just on the A a couple of episodes ago. Her birthday is today. She is the uh, fantastic actress who was Desdemona, and immediately after we did uh, Water Buffalo, the Gorilla Shakespeare Company immediately moved in, and they did Othello, and Lauren Grace was Desdemona, beautiful Desdemona. Her birthday is today. Um, Cecilia Palmtag, her birthday was three days ago, August the 12th. Uh, she is a actor and a director. She was, um, she directed Lifetimes 3, and she was also Hedda in Hedda Gobbler. Uh, that was Off-Broadway West. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, um, one actor who was in uh, my play, Foreman in Paris, Laura Mitchler. Yep. Our, uh, our cafe lady. Yay! Is, uh, tomorrow, and I just love Laura, and she was just a fantastic presence on stage, although she didn't have a lot of lines. Um, on Monday, Avi Jacobson, who was also a guest on the Yay, he and I shared the stage at the Douglas Morrison. We did one ten in the shade, where I was Bill Starbuck, and uh, he was a sort of a mentor. So, uh, Avi, we want to thank him for uh, being on the Yay, and happy birthday to him. Also, um, a good friend of mine, Mimi Totten, she is an actress and a singer. She was in a mini musical of mine that I wrote uh, called Nia. And uh, also she, what else did we do? Oh, we did um, Godspell. We did Godspell. So in any case, that's my list. Um, any shows you want to uh, pump? Um, uh, yeah, and if you guys have shows or, or people that you want to, you know, acknowledge, get a shout out to, please do. Um, there is one show that is currently going on, and that is the King Lear with the SF Shakes. Um, and I will make sure that I give you the links to all these things today, Ridge, so that Mm -hmm. that can get in um they're doing uh saturdays at seven o'clock sundays at 4 p.m it is a live performance online through youtube yeah. um it, it is too. it is not zoom <laughs> i that, will say that what you're seeing is um is a bizarre hybrid of theater and and camera work um but the performers are 
unquestionably powerful and wonderful. Yeah. Is Kimberly uh, Ridgway, is she directing that or is she involved in that? No, no, she's not involved with that one. Okay. Must no, be... um, Diane Lauren, uh, Diana Lauren Jones is uh, Cordelia and the Fool. Oh, you know what? It was, um, it was um, Elizabeth Carter. She's directing that, she right? She directed, Elizabeth Carter directed, yes. Okay. I got two, yes. very, two very fierce black ladies confused, but that's okay. Uh, okay, and then um, I've got a couple that are things that are go ongoing. Playgrounds Festival from this year, Best Of, is available on demand, but free. We've got a link where you can get it free through the 1st of September. Um, and I, oh gosh, did I not put, I did put mine down. Ah! Um, and... <laughs> The other one that I have is the, what I'm doing next as an actor, the Boredom Games 2020. Uh, this is with Shots SF. It'll be this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock. That will also be YouTube. It is free, but donations are always appreciated. Those are the shows that I know are coming up. So the latest thing that I'm doing, um, I just had a meeting just before I began the yay uh, today. Uh, with uh, I met with Susan Evans and Scott Munson and Christine Urin and a bunch of other writers and um, and uh, creatives, and we are creating what is known as the Breck Project. Uh, we're updating uh, Breck's Fear and Misery in the Third Reich Yay. and putting it in the modern times, uh, in the era of Trump. And I've got a piece that'll be done called Judicial Process, and Christine has one, The Spy, Scott Munson will be doing Chalk Cross. Basically, uh, Breck, he wrote all of these pieces to talk about what life was going on just before World War II, uh, what was life in Germany as Hitler was sort of taking over. And we're sort of paralleling it to what's happening right now. We're trying to uh, release it. Uh, we don't know if it's gonna be a Zoom thing or if it's going to be uh, recorded in an outside area, but uh, that will be done uh, just before election day. It'll be, I think a week, probably the last week of October. But that oh. I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll be talking more about that as we go along, but it's, it's a project. It wasn't the piece that you just did um, also one of those for Bindlestiff? Uh, well, Angasphia, that was not accepted by the Breck Project, uh, but uh, I, I wrote basically a bunch of stuff. I'm always okay. overwriting, so <laughs> I'm like, hey, if you don't like that, then you can take that. So Angasphia will not be a part of that, but uh, Angasphia is on uh, YouTube, so anyone can- I saw it, it's wonderful. Thank you. Little dystopian, but you know it is what it is. Bob, Travis, did you guys enjoy? Shout outs, guys. Not, not yet, but there will be. There will be news from Madison. I promise. <laughs> and likewise from Fountain Valley. Once we get back to school. Did you guys enjoy uh, the yay? Um, you, you know, it's uh, great seeing you guys again. It's great seeing you, and nice to meet you, Norman. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I love hearing the stories. It, it, it's been so much fun. It's really, really cool. There's very, there's very little better than sitting around talking theater with old friends and new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, talking shop. All righty. So, um, at, you know, people are watching this on YouTube. Uh, please like and subscribe. I'm telling you what all the YouTubers' influences do. You know, even this old stogie, this 51-year-old guy. Uh, please like and subscribe. And, you know, if you have some issues with the show, let us know uh, on the comments below. If you are listening to this on the podcast, you can listen to this on any podcast that you listen to your podcast, any app, basically. Um, if you're an Android user, you can use the SoundCloud ad app or just go on soundcloud.com. The A was created by theater people for theater people. If you have a show you want to advertise or if you just want to advertise yourself, let us know. Hit us up on Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. I'm at Red Space Clay. And I'm at Hoosier Hoosier. Bob, Travis, uh, do you have any social media that you people can connect with you? Uh, you can find me anytime at, uh, at Travis Bedard. All right. Is that Twitter or Instagram or what, what is it? Yes. <laughs> Everything. Hey. How about Everywhere. you, Bob? How about you, Bob? Uh, I've got FVHSTheater.com. Okay. You'll have to send that link. Send, send me a link so that uh, people can connect with you. Will do. Alrighty, folks. Well, uh, stay warm. Keep your mask on. Stay safe. And as we always say on the A, we, we got gotta find a better sign off. And we are out. <laughs>